for the invitation. I, oh, okay. um, I think the, you know, the, the silver lining of all the COVID crazy is that we've all been able to give talks in places and to audiences that we might not otherwise. And so this certainly falls into that category. Um, and as I said to Yulia already, it has the honor of being, I think, the earliest talk I've ever given because it is seven in the morning here. So um, I have had some coffee, but if I say something crazy, stop me because, you know, I might just not be fully awake. Um, yeah, so thank you for the introduction. And so I will just start really broadly by sort of espousing, if you will, my worldview. And so something that has always captivated me and that I think biologists and non-biologists alike can appreciate is that really different kinds of animals nonetheless exhibit similar kinds of behaviors. So, um, whoop, there we go. Uh, aggressive kinds of behaviors, mating and courtship kinds of behaviors, and parental and affiliative kinds of behaviors. And so on the one hand, then we have this sort of broad scale similarity and overlap, but on the other hand, there's obviously incredible diversity in how exactly animals exhibit these behaviors, what kinds of adaptations they have to do them, and the kinds of cues that they're integrating to decide when and if to perform them. And so for me personally, this, this push-pull between similarity on the one hand and, and unique diversity and differences on the other has always led me to wonder whether shared or distinct mechanisms give rise to similar behaviors. Or another way of saying this, how flexible are the mechanisms underlying behavior? So are there many possible solutions, if you will, to a given adaptive problem, or are biological systems somehow constrained such that the same solutions are repeatedly targeted? And so I think on some level, um, you know, this is a question we can ask about any trait of interest. I happen to be particularly interested in behavior. And it's also ultimately a question, I think, about the kinds of mechanisms that bias evolution and development into certain channels so that that lead to a certain path. And so one of the things that I have thought about quite a bit um, throughout my uh, career is how phenotypic plasticity might play a role as one of these biasing influences that might channel evolution towards certain paths. And so I want to kind of set up the, the really broad picture here in terms of how people have thought about this and talked about it, including some people in the room. Um, so if we just imagine then that we have some trait, arbitrary trait here on the x-axis and some environment on the y-axis, we can think about uh, the environment lower down here being ancestral and then moving up being derived. So these animals are perhaps moving into a novel environment or the environment is shifting around them. In either case, uh, we can assume there's some optimum trait in the ancestral environment. So let's just say it's being a medium sized green dot uh, makes you well adapted, high fitness, um, high survival. And then we can imagine there's some new optimum in this derived environment. And so perhaps it's being a smaller yellow dot. So if animals then move into the novel environment, um, they or perhaps their offspring through phenotypic plasticity, so before any genetic change, there's a couple of outcomes that we could imagine. On the one hand, maybe they reach that optimum immediately. Um, so without any genetic change, they're just plastically able to get there. Alternatively, um, maybe they get part of the way there. So they're looking smaller and more yellow, but not quite to the optimum. And in this case, we would consider um, the plasticity to be adaptive in the sense that they're moving in the right direction, but they haven't quite gotten there. Alternatively, um, we could imagine that the plasticity actually takes them away from the optimum. So instead they're getting larger in blue. I mean, in this case, we would consider the plasticity to be non-adaptive, so away from the optimum. And so what's important about these different scenarios is that they have important uh, differences in how we think they may influence subsequent selection. So in the first case, if animals get all the way to the optimum without genetic change, um, there's shielding from selection. So there's nothing really for selection to act on. They've just made it there and that's it. In these other two cases, we assume that selection will act to push these individuals or to push these populations to the optimum. But why that's happening is somewhat different. So we think that both adaptive and non-adaptive plasticity could facilitate adaptation, but for different reasons. 
And so on the one hand, um, if the plasticity is adaptive, we imagine there might be co-options. So perhaps the um, genetic mechanism selection can somehow take advantage of whatever mechanisms were involved in the plasticity to get the rest of the way there. Alternatively, um, in the non-adaptive case, it may be that by moving away from the optimum, you actually increase the strength of selection. And so in, um, populations can more rapidly reach the optimum because selection is actually stronger than when you're close to the optimum. So again, plasticity important for evolution, but some debate as to why and how that's really working. So with that sort of set up um, broadly, I'm going to tell you two stories today uh, that represent somewhat different ways that I've thought about these big picture questions in the last few years. So the first story is going to be about fish, um, thinking about plasticity and evolution of transcriptional um, mechanisms. And the second story, the more recent one, is going to be about frogs and plasticity in parental care. So as a graduate student, I worked on these delightful creatures here, Trinidadian guppies, Pacelia reticulata. And these um, are freshwater live bearing fish. Uh, the males are brightly colored uh, down at the bottom. The females are larger and drab. And they've really become a model system in evolution uh, because of this setup here on the island of Trinidad, which has been called a natural laboratory. And the reason for that is, um, that in the Northern Range Mountains of Trinidad, specifically in these river drainages that I'm showing you here, we have a pretty unique setup. So if we zoom in on one of these river drainages, so we've got our higher order downstream stream here, um, going upstream this way. And at lower elevations, we have what are referred to as high predation sites. So here guppies coexist with a whole host of predators that prey intensely on them. As we move upstream, there are these waterfall barriers that these guppies can't cross. And so upstream of these barriers are what are classically referred to as low predation sites. Um, there are some predators here, but they prey primarily on juveniles. And so here guppies are kind of living the good life. And so we know from the genetics that high predation fish have repeatedly and independently colonized low predation environments in each river drainage. And so this is basically a naturally replicated experiment where we have high predation fish colonizing low predation environments and adapting to them. And what this has given rise to is repeated evolutionary transitions and parallel adaptive phenotypes. And so we know from actually many decades of work that these phenotypes are in fact adaptive. Um, what we didn't really know until more recently is to what extent these differences are genetically mediated versus just being plastic developmental differences. And so as part of the guppy group at CSU, we started using a breeding design to try to tease this apart. So what we did then, um, the overview here is that in the wild, again, we have these high and low predation populations naturally within a drainage. So each drainage is an evolutionary lineage. We took these fish, we bring them into the lab, we rear them for two generations to try to deal with maternal um, effects as best we can. And then we split second generation siblings into rearing environments with and without predators. And so we're splitting siblings here to try to control um, for genetic similarities. Um, and so this gives rise to essentially four experimental groups um, so that differ in their genetic background and rearing environment. Um, so what does this actually look like, these rearing environments? So we have these recirculating water systems in the lab. Um, and so each fish is, is alone or depending on the experimental design, maybe in a group in these tanks. And in the high predation condition or in the pred plus condition, we have a cichlid predator in the sump tank down here. And so these fish are constantly receiving chemical cues of the predator. Um, we feed these predator live predators live guppies, so they're also getting chemical cues um, of predation, we think, or basically of dead guppy. Um, and so we don't know exactly what the chemical cue is, but we know that these fish know that the predators are there. And so there's no visual contact, it's all chemical. And we leave the fish in those environments um, from the day they're born throughout the duration of the experiment. And so what we, our interpretation then of this design is if we compare fish from different genetic backgrounds in the same environment, we interpret that as a genetic difference. So this is like a classic common garden type of design. 
Whereas when we're comparing siblings um, reared in these different environments, but from the same genetic background, we interpret that as a developmental difference. And I wanna highlight that it's specifically also often this developmental difference in the high predation population that we're interested in, because this is what we would consider the ancestral plasticity. So this is the response we assume represents what happens when a high predation fish colonizes that low predation environment. So is released from that predation pressure. And so using this design, um, Without going into the details, I will just say that myself and others found differences in behavioral, morphological, and life history traits based on both genetic and developmental effects of predation. So we knew going in that at the sort of whole organism phenotypic level, uh, there, these different traits had both a genetic and developmental component to them. And so the next step then, as I mentioned earlier, I'm really interested in thinking about underlying mechanisms. And so what we wanted to do was look at gene expression. And the other great thing about using gene expression in this context is that we can sort of consider each gene an individual trait. And so then we're able to ask about these signatures of plasticity, non-adaptive adaptive plasticity in many hundreds, thousands of genes and get an overall picture rather than sort of having one morphological trait or one behavioral trait to kind of assess these broad scale patterns. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you about sort of two different experiments that happen in this context. And the first one was looking at rapid evolution in gene expression. And so for this, um, again, we have our basic sort of guppy setup here. And we took advantage of these experimental introductions that happened where from one high predation source population, multiple introduced populations were generated in areas that didn't previously have guppies. And we looked at the earliest stages of adaptation to these environments and asked this question of, do we see signatures of adaptive and non-adaptive gene expression in, this, uh, in these earliest stages of adaptation? Um, and so the first, so the first thing we did then was a relatively standard differential gene expression analysis comparing that high predation population um, to the low predation populations, the ancestral or the well established one as well as these introductions. And so if you just imagine these blobs are representing the genes um, that are differentially expressed between high and low and between high and the introductions. And we find that there are 136 genes overlapping um, between all of these comparisons. And so this is way more overlap than expected by chance. And so we interpret these or interpreted these as high confidence genes that probably these are genes that are important for adaptation to low predation because we're seeing them differentially expressed in all of these comparisons. And so what we then wanted to do was look at this question of adaptive versus non-adaptive plasticity. So I'm gonna show you a number of graphs that look like this. So I wanna orient you here. So on the Y axis, we have evolved expression divergence. So this is gene expression differences based on genetic differences. So common garden type setup, we look at expression differences. And then on the Y axis, or excuse me, that's the Y axis. On the X axis, we have plastic expression divergence. So this is expression divergence based on being in these different rearing environments, so developmental plasticity. And so we can map then for the same gene, these different expression differences. And when we see things fall along this axis, um, that means that plastic and evolved differences are in the same direction, either both up or both down. And we interpret that as representing adaptive plasticity. Conversely, when things are um, on the other axis, one is up and one is down, so they're in opposite directions, and we interpret this as non-adaptive plasticity. So that's the basic setup. Um, and so what did we find? So focusing on these 136 sort of high confidence genes that we think um, are important for the parallelism, we found what I hope you can see here is that there's many more gray dots than black dots. So what this is then is a very strong signature of non-adaptive plasticity associated with these genes that show expression, parallel expression divergence in our populations of interest. Um, and so our interpretation then sort of the take home from this work was that we found a strong signature of non-adaptive plasticity potentiating rapid adaptation. So this was super cool. This was very exciting. Um, you know, we published this, felt excited. 
And then the next things though, that we were curious about was, well, this is the earliest stages of adaptation. What about longer time scales? What if we look, you know, only at well-established populations? And also, what about independent evolutionary lineages? So these introduction populations were from the same high predation source population. And so this question of, you know, how flexible are the mechanisms? What if we look at different source populations, different lineages? And so this was really what formed the bulk basically of my dissertation. And so what I did was that I used, again, the same breeding design that I already told you about, but now looking at two drainages, so two independent lineages. I took adult males, um, siblings, again, from these different rearing environments. I ran them through um, what I lovingly refer to as my behavioral Olympiad, so looking at behavioral differences here, um, and I'm not going to talk about the details, but you can read um, about them if you are interested. And then I took whole brains um, for RNA sequencing and de novo transcriptome assembly and gene expression analysis. And so I'm going to gloss over the methodological details completely, but happy to answer questions or talk to anyone who's interested. Um, and just for context, this is a guppy brain on an American penny. So just to give you a sense of the size for these huge tissues that we are dealing with here. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to show you is then the output of this relatively standard differential gene expression analysis. Um, so here, um, this is after FDR correction to 0.05, we find some number of genes differentially expressed in both drainages um, based on genetic background. Um, interestingly, I'll just note that we find more genes uh, in drainage B, which is longer established. So more time to differentiate. So that's kind of cool. Um, and then we also find some number of genes differentially expressed based on development, so on rearing environment. Um, and so this is neat. And of course, we could talk about the details of this and what are these genes and what do they do. Um, but again, I'm going to kind of breeze past that because what I really want to focus on is this question once again of what's the relationship between the plastic and the genetic differences we see. And so if we look at overlap, once again, we see that indeed there are genes that uh, are differentially expressed in both contexts. And indeed, there is more overlap here than expected by chance. Okay, great. What does that overlap look like? So once again, this is this, is this question of adaptive versus non-adaptive plasticity. And so what we did then, I'm going to show you this uh, really similarly to as I did before, um, ancestral expression differences, plasticity here on the X, and evolved divergence on the Y. And so here the data look like this. And so you're like, great, there's dots. What's the take home message? Um, we found no association here in expression direction. So you're like, what gives, right? So I just told you a minute ago, strong signature of non-adaptive plasticity associated with adaptation. And now I'm telling you no signature of plasticity, either adaptive or non-adaptive associated with adaptation. So why this stark difference? Um, and so we think that this difference is probably largely related to time scale. So this first experiment I talked about was rapid adaptation first so the earliest stages of adaptation, we collected fish after a year, which is about three to four guppy generations. Whereas these other populations are well established, you know, so we're talking many, many years, about two million generations. And so what this suggests to us then is that the role of adaptive versus non-adaptive plasticity differs across time scales. And this could be, we think, because if you have non-adaptive plasticity at those earliest stages, selection is really strong to kind of get rid of those maladaptive responses. But over time, um, once you get rid of those, the closer you get to the optimum, actually the harder it is to kind of reach that last step because you're so close to it that selection is relatively weak. So we think this is a pretty cool outcome um, and something that's important because there's a lot of debate in the literature about the role of adaptive versus non-adaptive plasticity. And so our kind of take home from this was, well, maybe they're both important at different times in the process. Okay, so that answers that first question then about longer timescales. What about these independent lineages? And so I showed you this uh, already here, um, these different drainages. 
So now I'm going to ask, well, how similar are the responses of the different drainages? And so what we did to address that question is that we overlapped these two drainages. And so we find some number of genes um, that are overlapping. And so this is more overlap than expected by chance, but I will just point out, right, there's lots of non-overlapping stuff here too. And so we'll come back to that uh, idea in a moment. But for the overlapping stuff, for the overlapping genes, um, our sort of assumption is, well, if these genes are important in parallel adaptation, we also should see parallel parallelism in the expression divergence. So if the same gene is doing the same thing, it should change in the same direction. And so to get at that, I'm going to show you a graph that's really similar to the ones that I have been showing you. But now we have the two different drainages, evolved divergence in the two different drainages on our axes, which means that the interpretation is a little different. So genes that are on this um, axis here that are going in the same direction suggest concordant divergence. So same pattern across drainages, as opposed to non-concordant divergence where the drainages are showing opposite directions of expression. So what did we find? So um, the data look like this. And so in orange are the genes that were the 124 sort of high confidence overlapping genes. The gray dots are a more conservative estimate in which we took differentially expressed genes from both drainages and took the union of those. So anything differentially expressed um, to see if, you know, we're not to try to make sure we're not introducing bias by fo focusing on this small number. But in either case, um, or sort of doing this in a range of p-value cutoffs. And we tried a lot of stuff basically to be relatively confident and we don't find an association in expression direction. So there's more overlap than expected by chance, but these genes aren't really changing in the same direction. So sort of making it somewhat confusing as to, you know, are they doing the same thing? Is there actual parallelism here? Um, so this then basically summarizes the findings of these, this second study. So what if we compare them again back to the first study I told you about? And so here, once again, on the left, when we looked in the same lineage at these early stages of adaptation, we found a really strong concordance. So there's 136 genes that are overlapping and they're all or almost all except for one changing also in the same direction. So making us feel like, yeah, this is probably parallelism important for the phenotype. Whereas across these different lineages, we don't see that really signature at all. So there's more overlap than we expect by chance, but there's also a lot of non-overlap and we don't have the signature of, of parallel expression direction. And so our interpretation of this, um, the first piece then is that standing genetic variation influences mechanistic overlap. So what do I mean by that? Well, if we start from the same high predation ancestor, we're more likely to see the same outcome than when we compare across these distinct lineages where we're starting from different genetic backgrounds. All right, so let's talk about what's the take home message here. So I think that the really big take homes from this work from these two sort of different studies I've shown you is that the relationship between plasticity and adaptation um, depends on time scale as well as genetic background. So there's some subtleties here um, that I think are really fascinating um, and that, that open up a whole area to, to keep digging deeper into. And the other thing that I personally found super exciting is that I think that taken together, this also suggests that there's flexibility in the transcriptional mechanisms. So we know that at the level of the phenotype, there's lots of parallelism, but at the level of gene expression, we're actually seeing quite a lot of variation, suggesting, you know, there's more than one mechanistic sort of solution or path, if you will, to a similar phenotypic output. Um, so that's something that super excited me about this work. But something that I also wondered about as someone who works on the brain is that when we're talking about transcription, of course, we're down here at the level of individual genes. Um, but of course, genes don't act in isolation. And especially in the brain, there's really a clear hierarchical structure where genes are talking to each other. They're inside neurons. Neurons talk to each other. They form networks of neurons that form brain regions that talk to each other. And so there's this whole hierarchy um, of interactions 
that are important to giving rise to behavior, which is sort of an emergent property. And so um, something that, you know, also then came to interest me was, well, well, how do interactions work across these levels? And might we see somewhat different patterns at different levels? And so this is where we're gonna shift then um, into the frogs and taking sort of similar questions, but with somewhat different approaches and at different levels um, and thinking now about behavioral plasticity in parental care. So um, as a postdoc and in my own lab now, we work on poison frogs, primarily South American poison frogs and the family Dendrobatidae. And so I wanna just tell you a little bit about these um, wonderful creatures. So there's three hallmarks that we think um, of as identifying for these guys. First, they carry defensive chemicals, um, as the name implies. These are primarily small molecule alkaloids. They don't actually make these chemicals themselves. They get them from their diet. Um, and they also have this beautiful warning or aposomatic coloration to advertise that they carry these chemicals to tell you they are not delicious and that you should leave them alone. And then finally, and this is I think what people are less aware of, these animals have actually evolved quite elaborate forms of parental care. And so parental care broadly defined is any behavior um, on the part of the parents that increases offspring survival. And parental care has evolved across um, animals, including vertebrates and invertebrates, and it comes in three different flavors. So male uniparental, biparental, and female uniparental. And so what we really, what we love about the frogs is that closely related species exhibit all three of these different care strategies. And so we thought, well, this is a really cool system to do comparative work, um, to start to understand you know, what's important for parental care per se versus what's important in a male versus a female, what might be related more to pair bonding. And so this was the initial attraction of the system. And also for me, it was a question of all the guppy work was inside of one species, also zooming out to be able to look at patterns um, across species. Um, so great, these animals are parental. What does parental care look like if you are a poison frog? There's three stages that we tend to talk about. Um, the first is egg attendance. So unlike most frogs that you are probably familiar with, or I guess I shouldn't say that because I should say in North America or Europe, most frogs um, lay their eggs uh, in the water. They lay many, many eggs and then they leave and they're like, good luck um, never to see their offspring again. These guys lay their eggs on land that um, frees them from some predation pressure in the water, but that means they have to clean and hydrate their eggs. And it also means that when these eggs hatch, those tadpoles are still aquatic and they need to get to water. And so the next stage of parental care is what we call tadpole transport. And so this is in this case, a dad. And um, I hope you can see this tadpole on his back here um, and they will carry their offspring to pools of water. And then in some, though not all species, moms will actually provision their offspring until metamorphosis with unfertilized eggs that they lay for them to eat. And so this is a very cool be behavior that we call egg provisioning or also nursing. And since we're halfway through the talk when everyone's falling asleep a little bit, this is where we're gonna watch some videos. So um, I wanna show you these behaviors because I think they're just so cool. So here is in this case, dad, uh, he's got a tadpole on his back and he's wandering around and there's actually water in this tree hole. And so he's checking it out, deciding whether this is where he wants to leave his tadpole. And so in this case, he decides no, but so they will carry their tadpoles quite far distances. We know they are spatially navigating um, while they are doing this. They're making complex decisions about where to leave their tadpoles. Um, and it's really quite a remarkable and we assume also quite costly behavior. Uh, <clears throat> Um, so I'm not going to talk much about this behavior at all today, but I want to show it to you because it's very cool. Um, we did, uh, I have published on this, so if you're interested in reading more about it, you can look this up. But so this is this egg feeding or nursing behavior. And so what you're here, seeing here is the tadpole is actually begging for food. So it's vibrating along mom and sort of nibbling on her. This is an honest signal of need. So the tadpole is saying, hey, I'm hungry. Um, and in the absence of this begging, mom will not in fact lay eggs. And so um, this interaction is also really cool and interesting. We've also started working sort of more on the tadpole side because after you see this, you just can't help but think about what's going on in the offspring. 
And so then finally, if things do go well, um, here is a tadpole and here is an egg that has been laid for it and you will see delicious. Um, so this guy is going to mow down on this whole egg. Um, so they have specialized mouth parts to be able to eat these eggs. Um, and eggs, of course, are, you know, little protein packets. So um, interesting co-evolution between parents and offspring as well. Okay, so after a little uh, video detour, so the first thing that um, we did when I started working in the system was that we were interested in asking um, about this comparative question. So across these different species, um, how are and different sexes that that perform parental behavior in these species, how is that being negotiated? And what we found was that there were core brain regions important in parental care across species and sexes and increased expression of neuropeptides involved in parental care actually more broadly in vertebrates. And so I'm telling you about this because basically these two pieces here, these findings really pointed towards convergence, towards shared mechanisms within frogs, but also more broadly across vertebrates. And so I just finished telling you the story in guppies about flexibility and transcriptional mechanisms even within a single species. And now I'm telling you the story about shared mechanisms with, across different species and even across really divergent taxa. So what gives, right? These things seem somewhat opposing. And so this is where, um, to me, what was really fascinating and actually what you know continues to be the things I'm working on now is wondering whether these different patterns emerge at different levels of hierarchical organization. And so um, what I'm gonna tell you about now is sort of the starting points for that work that, that is ongoing in my lab. So um, I'm glossing over the details of this first comparative study, um, but so to dig a bit deeper into this, the second thing we did was that we zoomed in on Dendrobates tinctorius. Um, this is a male uniparental species. So typically the males are the ones providing care, but occasionally females will take over to ensure the survival of their offspring. So we have some behavioral plasticity here. Um, so as you know, I'm interested in plasticity. And we also thought, so this is cool. This will help us think about different mechanisms um, that facilitate this plasticity and then put that in the context of how this plasticity within a species might help or might lead to the evolution of different care strategies between species. So is this plasticity within this species what eventually leads to the evolution of biparental or female care instead of male care? So we wanted to dig into this a bit deeper um, using, again, this kind of sex typical versus sex reverse parental behavior. So the first thing we did was to look just at the sex typical condition. And so I'm going to show you here the males in blue in the next couple of slides, the females in yellow um, in these different care stages. And what's really important right now is that even though I'm showing you these different, these three different care stages, the females are non-caregiving in all of these cases. So Dad is the one doing egg care and tadpole transport, but we collected mom at the same moment in time, but she's not providing any care. We just know that it's mom because we house them in pairs in the lab. And so that will be important the next few slides or for the, really for the rest of the, the talk. So the first thing we wanted to do was look at the level of hormones. Um, and so I'm gonna show you a couple different hormones here. So we've got hormone level here on the Y axis. We've got our different care stages on the X axis. And the first hormone we looked at is cortisol. So classically implicated in stress, also important for metabolism and, and a host of other things. And so what did we find? So here is what the data look like. And we found um, an increase in cortisol in males during tadpole transport. And so this made a lot of sense to us. So the parents in the room are like, yes, I know that parental effort is stressful. And this is something that is seen across vertebrates. Um, and so we found that here. What surprised us was that we also saw an increase in cortisol in the female partners of these males. Okay. Well, what about testosterone? So in testosterone, we see a classic sex difference. So all the blue bars are higher than the yellow bars, more androgens in males. This is you know, pretty unsurprising. Um, and we see a decrease in testosterone during parental effort in the males. Again, this is in line with what's actually observed in many vertebrates. Um, 
the idea is that there's a trade-off kind of between aggression and parental care. And so there's decreased testosterone, which leads to decreased aggression and increased care. Again, what surprised us is that there's actually also a significant decrease here in the females. And so I know it looks less obvious because all the yellow bars are lower, but it is a significant decrease. And then finally, we looked at estradiol, and here we saw the classic sex difference that we would expect higher in females, lower in males, um, and no association with the behavior. Okay, so not quite what we expected. Um, what about brain gene expression? Because we also collected brains from these animals. And so here, um, I wanna orient you to this visualization because it's a little unusual, but in the corners of this triangle, we have our different care stages. And the large numbers um, close to these care stages are genes upregulated in that particular stage. And the smaller numbers in between are not differentially expressed. So this is again, a quite standard differential expression type analysis. And so if we just look um, here at no care and egg care, there's two total differentially expressed genes, this one and this one. One is up in egg care and one is up in no care as of compared to the other. Um, and what I think you can see pretty readily here is that there's not a lot of differences between no care and egg care. There's lots of differences to tadpole transport. And so this kind of mirrors what we saw with the hormones. Tadpole transport is the most different stage. So this was in the males. This was you know, somewhat what we expected. What we again did not expect is that we see the same pattern in females. And if anything, we actually see more genes differentially expressed in females. And so just to drive this point home here, um, I'll show you some heat maps of these genes. I know heat maps are somewhat overwhelming to look at, but so I'll point out the two things I want you to notice. One is that um, if we look at our no care and egg care samples over here in the lighter colors, they're not clustering. So they're all just kind of mixed up over here, as opposed to these transport samples that are clustering really nicely. So that indicates tadpole transport is the most different stage, true in the females as well. Um, and if I just highlight these tadpole transport here too, you can also see that there's a clear sort of difference with up and down regulation during transport as compared to the other two stages. And there's also some genes I'll just note in here that we think are particularly interesting, which I'm happy to chat about if people are interested. Okay, so to summarize this so far then, we found sex typical differences in testosterone and estradiol, not surprising. Um, and we found testosterone decreases and cortisol increases during tadpole transport in fathers. That was not surprising, but also their non-caregiving female partners, which was more surprising. Um, and <clears throat> similarly, we found brain gene expression most difference during most different during tadpole transport, um, but that in both male and females. So to summarize then, we found hormonal and brain gene expression patterns were different in parental males and mirrored in their non-caregiving female partners, which quite surprised us because again, these females are not performing these behaviors. <clears throat> Excuse me. So initially we thought we were gonna characterize sex differences and then be able to look at the parenting females to understand you know, whether they look more like the males. But now we have a behavioral difference and we didn't see at all the differences we thought we would in hormones and brain gene expression. So even though this wasn't what we expected, we still thought that looking at the plasticity in the females might help us understand this better. And so what we did to get at that was that we did um, male mate removals. This helps induce this uh, plastic takeover in the females. And then we looked at um, these females who are now parenting. And so I'm gonna use the same color code as I did before the yellow and blue for my sex typical condition. In the caregiving females, I'm gonna use purple. And we have here a somewhat different comparison. We have control females and transporting females. Control females are females who have hatched tadpoles. They've had their mates removed, but they do not transport in a time matched to our transporting females who are transporting their hatched tadpoles. So in essence, what I'll just point out then is that these control females actually are really similar to these um, dark yellow transport females here who are non-caregiving, but at a stage where the males would be transporting. So I know that's a little bit confusing. So um, hopefully that will 
make more sense also when we look at the data. So the first thing we did was look at hormones and we actually found no differences at all um, between our control and transport females. If I had done this experiment first, I would have been totally perplexed. But in the context of what I showed you previously, right, we the, the control females are basically like the females who still have, who are have hatched tadpoles but are not transporting. And we already saw hormonal changes that I showed you previously. And so in the context of that, our interpretation here is, well, they're not really getting an extra boost when they perform the behavior because we already saw those, chain, uh, those hormonal changes in the absence of the behavior. And so then the other thing we looked at was neural activity patterns. Um, and so I'm just gonna really briefly say that we look at this by using, um, an immunohistochemical marker for phosphorylated ribosomes. So ribosomes become phosphorylated when neurons are active. We can use an antibody to grab onto that. And what that ends up looking like is um, over here on the right are these brown dots. So these brown dots are neurons where the antibody has bound, indicating cells that have recently been active. Um, and so we can basically count brown dots as a readout of neural activity. And this is something we do quite standardly. Um, and we did this across a wide range of brain regions. If these words mean something to you, that's great. If they don't, it totally doesn't matter. I'm only showing you this to highlight that the data I'm gonna show you are specifically from one brain region, the pre-optic area. And I'm choosing this brain region because this is one that we had found as sort of a core brain region important for parental care across species of frogs and also actually across vertebrates more generally. So if, at the level of neural activity then, which is now on the y-axis, and again, we've got our, our different care um, stages here on the x. And so the, for the sex typical condition, what we found was an increase in neural activity in the males during tadpole transport. And as opposed to the hormone and brain gene expression data I showed you here, their female partners did not show that increase in neural activity. So they had changes in hormones, changes in gene expression, but they're not performing the behavior and they don't have a difference in neural activity. If we compare that to sex reverse transport, we see an increase in neural activity in the, sex, in the transporting females, but not in the controls. And indeed the controls, um, again, highlighting this point, look much like the um, non-transporting females over here. So that sort of a sanity check, we think they're, they're pretty similar. Okay. So I know that that was a lot in a few slides. So let me just summarize then what I want you to take away from this. So at the level of hormones and brain gene expression, we saw that um, patterns were mirrored in actively tadpole transporting males and their non-caregiving female partners. In contrast, at the level of neural activity, we see that um, the activity patterns are really closely related to the active performance of the behavior. So we see an increase only in males and females that are transporting. And so the way we interpret this is that we think that those hormone and brain gene expression uh, differences that we saw in non-caregiving females were actually related to those females monitoring their male partners and sort of preparing them to be able to flexibly take over parental care. Um, and so what this really sort of where we're at now with this project is trying to understand then how behaviors are coded across these hierarchical levels. So how do you get changes in gene expression that aren't propagating to the behavioral level? And what can that help us understand about how behavior is regulated? And so this is where we're really digging deeper in my lab right now. And I'll also just point out that I think taken together with the guppy work that I showed you initially, what I think is really cool here is that these projects suggest that perhaps there's also more flexibility at lower levels of organization. So you can sort of turn the knobs at the level of gene expression quite a bit before you see um, changes at higher levels. So changes in the phenotype of, in this case, behavior. And I think this is really cool and has the potential to help us understand how evolution proceeds um, and how we might be able to get changes in one level before we see changes in another. And so there's some really cool um, work already out there 
um, that, that addresses this by people like Eve Martyr. And I think what's really exciting about the current moment in science is that we're also at a place where we have techniques that will hopefully let us kind of bridge the gaps um, between genotype and phenotype in a way that, that is somewhat unprecedented. And also for people like me in a way that we can apply in non-model organisms, which is pretty exciting. And so again, that's, that's sort of where my head is at these days and, and what we're working on in my lab now. And so with that, I also want to thank my lab. Um, it has been a strange time to set up a lab and I'm very grateful to have wonderful people who have helped me do that in the lab, um, as well as new people coming in. So we're in a bit of a growth spurt, which is also exciting. Um, I also wanna thank the Hoke lab where I did my PhD and the O'Connell lab where I was a postdoc, um, which is where much of the work that I showed you today happened. Um, funding uh, from NSF in particular, many fish and frog room helpers who um, make it possible for us to do this work, and then also you for your attention. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you.